Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Felder, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. Okay, once again, good to have everybody in, and uh, we're ready to make number four this afternoon, and uh, then we'll be heading for home. <clears throat> All right, let's be turning to 1 Timothy. Now we're going to move into chapter 2, verse 1. 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 1. Again, we always like to welcome our television audience. We realize that every day we pick up new listeners, and uh, we always have to let you know that we're not associated with anybody. You know, that's one of the questions we get. Well, does somebody underwrite you, or how do you pay for your programs, and so forth? So, no, we're not underwritten. We're not associated with anyone. We are as free as the bird. All I have to respond to is the Lord himself. And uh, we rely totally on the gifts of God's people, and uh, he's always provided. So we don't foolishly go head over heels in debt, but uh, we try to keep our bills paid. And uh, as the funds become available, we reach out to more and more stations. And so it's uh, getting to the place where we're just reaching more and more people, and we just appreciate the prayers and the letters, <clears throat> as well as your financial help. All right, let's just move on. This is a Bible study. We go verse by verse most of the time, and uh, we are now in Second Timothy, I mean, First Timothy chapter 2, verse 1, where he says, I exhort therefore. And whenever Paul used the word therefore, what do you do? Well, you go back and remember what he had been talking about. And uh, so I think the main thing he has in this, therefore, is the faith that we've been talking about in the last two verses of chapter 1. So because of our faith, because we are people who believe what God says, that we are now in a position to make supplication and prayers and intercessions and the giving of thanks, not just for ourselves, but for who? For all men. In other words, we have a prayer responsibility way beyond our immediate circle of friends and family and so forth. <clears throat> now, whenever I speak on prayer, <clears throat> excuse me, I always like to remind people, and, and we do this, whenever someone says, well, uh, I just don't know how to pray. I want to bring you back a moment to Philippians chapter 4. Verses 6 and 7, which are my two favorite verses when it comes to prayer. Whether it's for all men, as he says here in verse 1, or whether it's for the kings and our men in high places, or our friends and loved ones, that's beside the point. When we pray, this should be our approach to the Almighty. <clears throat> Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 and 7. Be careful, or concerned, or you might even say worry, about nothing. But in everything, see now that's not qualifying, that means what it says, everything, whether it's physical, material, or spiritual, in everything by prayer and supplication, but here's the secret, with what? Thanksgiving. I still think that that is the secret to a successful Christian life, is to be a man or woman or a boy or girl that's full of praise and thanksgiving to God. I think God revels in our response in thanksgiving. All right, so in everything with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. Now, I imagine there, if there's anything that throws a curve at a lot of us, and I'll include myself as well, if God is sovereign and He's all-knowing and He knows the end from the beginning, why should we pray? Well, now that's a tough one to answer. We're not going to change God's mind. I, I don't believe that we can do that. But the only way I can answer this is that God in His foreknowledge and in His sovereignty knows how we're going to pray, and so things all fall in place accordingly. In other words, if you would never pray, things probably wouldn't happen the way they do. And that's the only way I can look at it. We're not going to change God's mind. We're not telling Him how to run His business. 
But on the other hand, we have this constant admonition to pray and let our requests be made known unto God. And he's going to handle it according to his sovereign design. That's as far as I can go with it. I'm convinced that you can't twist his arm and you can't finagle something out of God just by virtue of your smooth talk. But the scripture over and over, here we've already got two instances where Paul not only tells Timothy, but he writes to the Philippians that in everything we make our requests known unto God. Now what does that mean? You verbalize them. You tell him. You don't just assume that God knows what you need. We are to verbalize it. That's what prayer is all about. All right, now this is an interesting verse coming up then. You make your requests known unto God, and then verse 7. And some of you have heard me teach this more than once. Whether God answers yes, no, or maybe later, the answer is in verse 7. Every prayer that you prayed is already answered in verse 7. And what is that answer? That the peace of God that passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds. How? Through Christ Jesus. And why is everything put on Christ Jesus? Well, I was going to use it a little later in Timothy, but I think probably this is as good a time as any. Go all the way back to the book of Revelation. This is just an example of why everything rests on what Christ has done there at the cross. Revelation chapter 5, verse 9. And I think this holds true to everything that we pray for, everything that God does on our behalf, and here's the reason. Revelation chapter 5, verse 9. All back there? And they sang a new song. And they said, Thou art worthy. Now who is the thou? The Lord Jesus. See, God the Son up there in verse 5. Thou art worthy to take the book, to open the seals thereof. And now here's what makes him worthy of everything. Not just this little instance of revelation, but of everything. For thou wast slain. See? his death on the cross. For thou wast slain, and you have redeemed us to God by your blood. See? The work of the cross is what makes him worthy. And you have redeemed us out of every kindred, tongue, and people, and nations, and so on and so forth. But see, that's why we can go to the Lord with every request possible and he is capable and worthy to do whatever he deems best for us is because of what he has already accomplished and who he is. He is the God of glory. He's the God of creation. He's sovereign. He's in total control, total power, as we're going to see in the next uh, few moments as we move on in Timothy. All right, but back to verse 7 for just a second in Philippians 4, that no matter how you pray, Whatever you ask for, whether God does not do as you request, or whether he may say later, or whether he answers in your own time frame, the peace of God. Now you know what that is? That's something that the world in general knows nothing of. The peace of God. Now what does that tell you? That if you've been praying for a loved one to get well, and God doesn't answer that. And he takes that loved one. Now what does that mean? That means because of what Christ has already done, because of who he is, we don't have to fall all apart. We have the peace of God that even though that loved one has been taken from our midst, we have all that we need. Now, that doesn't mean we don't sorrow. That doesn't mean that if you lose a loved one, you're not going to shed tears and you're going to be alone. But you don't fall apart. God sustains us, see, and through Christ Jesus our Lord. All right, along that same line, let me come all the way back to Romans. Back to Romans, because like I said in an earlier program, you know, the more Scripture we can base our thinking on, the more solid our faith. Romans chapter 5, verse 1. <clears throat> Romans 
chapter 5, verse 1. Starts out again with one of Paul's favorite words. What is it? Therefore, because of all that he has just said in chapter 4, and we used this chapter a couple programs back, the faith of Abraham. How that by faith plus nothing, God was able to declare him righteous. Now, verse 1 of chapter 5. Therefore, being justified by what? Faith. Plus nothing. Now, it doesn't say that. I'm saying that. I'm just showing that there's nothing added to it. So being justified by faith. Now, what have we got? Peace. See? God-given peace. We don't have to fret and wonder, am I going to make it? Have I done enough? Am I trying hard enough? Now, we were just talking at break time. I don't want anyone to ever feel that just because we're justified by faith, that's as far as we have to go. Oh, no way. In fact, I'll go to Ephesians now. We were talking about it at a break time. But nevertheless, let's finish this verse, and then we'll go to Ephesians chapter 2. Therefore, being justified by faith, plus nothing, we have peace with God, and again, through the work of what person? Through Jesus Christ. Same language that he used in Philippians 4, 6, and 7. We have that transcending peace through Jesus Christ our Lord. All right, now then, come back to Ephesians 2 before I forget it. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and 10. I was going to use it in the previous program, and I ran out of time, so I guess it's intended that I use it now. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and 10. Ephesians 2, verses 8, 9, and 10. You all there? For by grace, God's unmerited favor, which means we didn't have anything going for us that he would have to say, well, I better do this. No, no. It's by his unmerited favor. You are saved through faith plus, is it? No. Come on, your Bible is just as plain as mine. You're saved by God's grace through what? Faith. Taking God at His word. Well, what do I take at His word? That He died for my sin and yours. His blood was shed. He arose from the dead. And we believe it. And the moment we believe it, God moves in. In fact, I had an interesting letter the other day, and I, uh, I haven't answered it yet, and I don't know as I will, especially since I'm doing it here on the program, because I know the gentleman listens. And he was wondering what came first, justification or forgiveness or redemption. And, of course, he had all the scripture verses. He'd put a lot of work into it. I could tell that. Well, if I were to write him in one sentence, you know what I'd tell him? Hey, it all happened instantly. It didn't come in a sequence of events. God didn't just first forgive you and then come back and say, I'll justify you, and then come back and say, well, you're redeemed. That was a one-second transaction. The moment we believe with heart faith, God did all of that instantly. And it's all done. All right, so we've been saved through faith. Verse 8 again, reading on, not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Well, goodness sakes, I don't have to tell you how much work do you do for a gift. Nothing, nothing. Somebody doesn't say, well, I'll give you a diamond ring if you do this. Someone doesn't say, well, I'll give you something or other if you do this. Then it's not a gift. But a gift is that which comes totally without merit. All right? So salvation is by God's grace through faith in what he has said. It's not of anything that we can do because it's the gift of God. And now look at the next verse. Not of works. What's works? Anything that you can do by making up your mind to do something. I don't care what it is. I've made reference to this once before, years and years ago. When Iris and I were young, we used to check out books in the library, and she'd read one, and I'd read the other, and then we'd switch, and so forth. 
and uh, before the kids came along, you know, and we weren't just covered up with all the activity, and we read a lot more than we have time for today. But one of the little books we read was about a little fellow up in the Ozarks, and uh, he was getting to be about 14 or 15, and one day it came into his mind that he'd been kind of an ornery little rascal, but he thought he was going to please his mom and his dad, and so he told his little buddy, he said, I think next Sunday I'm going to, you remember it, honey? Next Sunday I'm going to go up and join the church. Sound familiar? Sure it does. But you see, what was the little fellow doing? A works. He made up his own mind and told his friend what he was going to do. That's works. And that's not faith. Now his intentions were good. I'll bet his mama was thrilled to death in the story. But whatever. That's what I'm talking about. That's works. When you can make up your mind and say, well, I'm going to do this or I'm going to do that. I don't care what it is. Then it's a works. And it does not count for eternity. All right. Now then, verse 10. Here's where we move on after the Lord has saved us, after we've gained peace with God, after we're forgiven and we're redeemed and we're justified. Now what do we do? Hey, we get to work. We get to work, for we are His workmanship. Now the Greek word here is poema, from which we get the word poem, from which we also get the word, in a little further word down the way, symphony. In other words, something that has been beautifully, artistically put together. That's what we are as believers. God has formed us and has given us particularly gifts and abilities and talents for a particular use. And that's what we're to do. We're to use it. Everybody has a different ability, but they all work together to be just like a symphony, see? And so we are His workmanship. We are something that He has now put together. We have been created as a new creature in Christ. For what purpose? Good works, of course. Good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. In other words, we live to serve. And it's not for salvation, but it is for what? Reward. Now, I wasn't going to do this, but here's why I don't get very far, Jerry. <laughs> I thought I was going to finish 1 Timothy today, but see, that's why I don't get as far as I think I'm going to. Come back to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Now that we're talking about good works, we better pursue it a little bit. Because, hey, we're human. And whenever we start doing something that is not for salvation now, we're starting to do it for just simply because we're doing good works. Being human, what's our question? What am I going to get? And there's nothing wrong with that. You remember when Jesus was dealing with the twelve and they were about at the end of his three years? And they came down toward Jerusalem, and Peter said, Now, Lord, we have followed you ever since you picked us up up there in Galilee. What are we going to have there for? Remember that verse, Matthew 19? What will we have there for? Well, did the Lord scold him for worrying about what he'd get because of his good works? No. He says, Peter, you're going to rule one of the twelve tribes of Israel when I come into my kingdom? So it's a logical question. Now, for us today, we're created in good works. We get out. We get busy. What are we going to get? Well, 1 Corinthians 3. See? 1 Corinthians 3. Drop down to verse 11, honey. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 11. All got it? For he says, another foundation other than Jesus Christ, which Paul lays as the foundation of this age of grace, <clears throat> for other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. In other words, again, upon that finished work of the cross, we've entered into a building process of works on that finished work, appropriated by our faith, and now look what happens. Verse 12. 
as a believer. God gives us a series of building materials in which we labor and put into the building on that foundation. Now, if any man build upon this foundation as a believer, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and stubble, six materials, three of which can never burn, three of which go up in a puff of smoke. All right? Every man's work, as a believer, we're not talking about the lost here, we're talking about believers. Every man's work as a believer shall be made manifest, going to be put in the spotlight. For the day, the judgment day, the Bema seat day, not the white throne judgment for lost people, but the judgment of the Bema seat for believers. And you pick that up in 2 Corinthians 5. All right, the day when we'll stand before the Lord Jesus as the judge of our Christian life. The day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed or tested by fire. And the fire shall test every man's work of what sort it is. Now you've got to stop there a little bit and pick this apart. You go back to the book of Revelation, what are the eyes of Jesus likened unto? Eyes of fire. All right, now then, these eyes of fire are going to examine the works of the believer. And he's going to look at what we have built in our little section of the wall on that foundation, which is Christ Jesus. All right, now here we've been building throughout our whole Christian life with good works. But some of those good works are going to go up in a puff of smoke. They're nothing more than wood, hay, and stubble. Some are going to remain because they were comprised of gold, silver, precious stones. See the analogy? Now, what's it all based on? Motive. Motive. Why do we do the things we do? You can be the best worker that anybody could imagine. And if you're just doing it to elevate the self, forget it. It's a puff of smoke. If you're doing it to bring honor and glory to the Lord, if you're doing it to enhance fellow believers, it's, it's gold, silver, and precious stone. That's what it's going to be. All right, now let's move on. <clears throat> Verse 14. If any man's work abide, it survives those fiery eyes. It's gold, silver, or precious stone. Now remember, what does fire do to those three elements? It purifies them takes away all the dirt and the dust and the dross. It purifies them. And so as the Lord Jesus will look at the works of believers whose motive is right, and they've been doing it for not self but for others, then it shall remain. And he shall receive what in verse 14? Reward. Reward. Now I know a lot of people don't like that. They say, oh, you don't dare talk about reward. Why not? This book does. Paul uses the analogy of the Olympic runners, and we're to be like them, up to a point. How? My, they trained, and they worked, and they prepared for the race. And why did they run the race? To gain the crown, which was only a wreath in those days, wasn't even a gold medal. But the analogy was they went through all that period of training and training to run the race with all that was in them to receive the reward. And that's what we're to do. We're not saved to sit. We're saved to serve, regardless of what you are. And when older people come and say, well, Les, I can't do anything anymore. Well, yes, you can. You know that back in London's darkest days, when London was about to be submerged in the most iniquitous generation that you can imagine, two elderly ladies were responsible for turning London right side up. How'd they do it? Prayer. They prayed, and they prayed, and they prayed, and revival hit London. And so don't ever say, I'm too old to serve. You can always pray. All right, let's go on. Verse 15, if any man's work is burned, it's nothing but hay, wood, and stubble. Now, these are believers. 
and they've got works that amount to nothing but wood, hay, and stubble. It shall be burned, and he shall suffer loss, not his salvation, but his reward. And he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. In other words, it's going to be a, a slim escape so far as rewards are concerned. And so there's the admonition that we're saved by faith plus nothing because of the finished work of the cross and the grace of God. But then we get busy and we serve. All right. Now let's come back to 1 Timothy chapter 2, and maybe I can finish one verse. Let's go to verse 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2, now verse 2. <clears throat> so exhortation that we make prayers, intercession, giving of thanks for all men, but now we don't just stop for the mundane men around us our friends and neighbors, but our prayers are to extend to our men in high places. For us today, it's presidents, senators, congressmen. We're to pray for kings, for all that in authority. Now, believe it or not, why do we pray for our men in high places? For our own good. There is a bit of selfishness here. We are to pray for these men so that we may live quiet and peaceable lives. Isn't that amazing? There's nothing wrong to pray for that. God doesn't want us to just grovel in abject poverty and uh, under uh, the heavy boot of some foreign power. God wants us to live quiet and peaceable lives. And we're to pray to that end. This is what government is for. Government is to, and I imagine this is where our founding fathers got the term, that we are in the pursuit of what? Happiness. That's our God-given right. The pursuit of happiness. And I'll tell them in my classes the other night, you know, if you know anything of human history, very few percent of the population of the world down through history have enjoyed that. We are unique. Most of the peoples of the world have lived a life of poverty and destitution and unhappiness. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Felding. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry if this program has been a help to your study of the scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, Route 1, Box 760, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552, or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Feldick.